Welcome to Alabama Gristmill. Good to have you back uh, listening and appreciate all the subscribers out there to uh, the podcast. And I am Mike Causey. This is, uh, and I'll say hello to my co-host, the co-host Donna Causey. Hello. A lot of times I butt in on you. This time I, <laughs> yeah, I, I was restrained. Yeah. And I talked long. <laughs> yes, you were restrained. I like to get, I get excited about the stories and I want to get to talking about them. Well, we've got a great story here today. It's uh, one that I, I had no clue about. The, the, uh, we had a plague in Alabama that actually started in Alabama and, and actually ended in Alabama. So, And it was tied into eating grits, which I never thought that would be something that would be dangerous. Oh, yeah. It, it, I ran across it by doing some research on grits. So it, it's really interesting. I mean, it's a, it's an in, and anybody that uh, eats grits today needs to listen to it. As a simple food as grits. Could lead to you dying, which is pretty exactly. pretty crazy. And then the simple solution they came up with to prevent that from happening. But before we get into that, we want to get into what was a the popular element of their articles in on the Alabama Pioneer site. It was uh, the Ten Commandments of Grits and the way they should be uh, eaten and prepared and everything. So we'll go ahead and get into that now. Oh yes, I don't know many people that live in the South that don't love grits. That's that's been one of our big stories. There's all kind of ways we eat them. Yes, it's definitely one of the most popular stories on our site, just because everybody's got their own opinion about it. <laughs> I know, and it has their own special recipe. You know, there's many ways you can cook them, and, but there's really the Southern way. Well, it's something that's very personal. You know, it's, it, everybody's it got their strong opinion on grits. I mean, that's... Uh, it, what's so funny is everybody, we're all from the South, but we all have our little kind of thing that we do with them <laughs> you know we add a little something here and a little something there that makes it personal and yeah it's a it is definitely a the, the southern favorite and a southern staple that i would say the northerners don't quite get too much <laughs> I know it, 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 they probably don't look real good you know to them and, you know well, they think it's like porridge or something the story today i kind of give you i think they got kind of a bad reputation and this story is probably going to be a reason why. So, well, f- well, first let's let's go into you know the, what what made the story popular. Our, our story popular on the website is we actually uh, found uh, the Ten Commandment of grits. Right. This is how serious we are about this stuff. Right. We got we right. got Ten Commandments of grits and the way it should be. Exactly. So I'll let you go ahead and tell me that what's that first? What's the first? The first one is Thou shall not put syrup on thy grits. That's a given. That's a given. <laughs> Thou shalt important. not eat grits with a spoon. Now, I, now this one I've broken. I used to eat grits as cereal, kind of when I was growing up. And yeah, I think I have too. Yeah, I it's, gave it to you that way. Especially, mother, especially mother when you make it when it when it comes out not as thick as you want it. Right. You know, that's 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 definitely the way to way to go there. And then the third one is thou shalt not eat cream of wheat and call it grits. But this is blasphemy. <laughs> I think that one's pretty good. Thou shalt, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's grits. Well, you couldn't have a, you can't have a Ten Commandments without coveting. No, Benny, that's right. You, know. <laughs> you can't do that. Thou shalt only use salt, butter, and cheese as toppings for thy grits. Yes, and, I do. And you, you, you can mix the cheese in a little bit. The cheese grits are really popular. Now, now some Northerners that like that, they like cheese grits. I you know, like but, cheese grits, too. Yeah, I do too. I, I somewhat. I don't like them as much as just regular grits, though, with butter. But lots of butter. This is what I have an addendum on. I would say, what about bacon in that in the grits? Yeah, I now I've occasionally liked those. But like I say, the best for me is just grits and butter. Just grits and lots you're of and the, that's not very very healthy. But it's that's what I love. But but the big thing is is thou shalt not eat instant grits. Oh, yes. They just do I mean, not taste. We got you, technology. We got all these new ways of making stuff fast, but do it the old solid, the solid, not instant grit way is the way to go. That's fine. The big thing you got to remember, though, and with the rest of the commandments, thou shalt not put syrup on thy grits, or thou shalt not put sugar on thy grits. All of those, they take the rest of them all the way yeah, down. Yeah, that's 7 through 10 is no <laughs> syrup and no sugar on the grits at all whatsoever because at that point, you don't have grits. You don't. You have a cereal, and that's a different thing. That's not a. That's not grits. You know, it, we talk about grits, though, but did you know, and we think it's a really a Southern thing, and it is a Southern thing, but did it's you definitely. know that the Native Americans introduced grits and eggs to us? 
did not know that, but I could I could see that you know becoming new over in the country and uh, yeah, because they, the, they came from corn and they they found it's really true. Back in 1961, there was an archaeological find in Alabama that dated back to the early 1800s among the Native American settlement area, and they found a connection to the grits and eggs, and it was from Florida State University. The article here, I'll just quote it. It says an article, archaeological party from Florida State University has brought back evidence that Alabama Indians were enjoying grits and eggs as far back as 150 years ago. Almost an entire eggshell was found by the group during an eight-week dig in the Horseshoe Bend area of the Tallapoosa River around 50 miles east of Montgomery last summer. The digging took place at the site of the old Indian village of New Yorkie for New York. New New York he meant New York. One thing to keep in mind is, you know, that you said it was 150 years ago they found it, but they this this archaeological find was back in 1961. That's right. So that puts it back into the 1800s. Like, you, and you mentioned that before, but I just want to make that clear. It's right, 150 back. years before. I, yeah, that's what early I'm 1800s. Yeah, right. So it goes way back. And so they actually gave us so we can thank the Native Americans for presenting us with this wonderful tree. Dr. Charles H. Fairbanks was the person who found it. He said there were indications that the Indians placed the eggs in soft key, a hominy grits used widely by the Indians. And he said the shells were the first indication he knew of that the Indians of the Southeast included hen eggs in their diet, although it was known the Greeks and other Indians kept chickens back then. And they found eggshells and pig bones and so forth and so on. The dish came from a Native American Muscogee tribe recipe in the 16th century of of Indian corn, similar to hominy or maize, according to Wikipedia. So it goes back to even the 16th century. We're we're going way, way back there. And they say the word grits was derived from an old English word called grit, G-R-Y-T-T, meaning coarse meal. And, of course, that's what it is. It's a food made from uh, ground corn. And it made into a coarse meal and bo- and boiled. And where was that ground corn usually ground up in? What what kind of meal was that? It was a corn meal. A grist meal. Oh, I mean, a, okay. It was a grist <laughs> meal, which is what our little <laughs> but, <laughs> podcast is about. I just I distract. Go back to the story. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you just, that's good. That's good. Okay, and it was ground in a coarse meal and then boiled, like I said. And hominy grits is a type of grits made from hominy, but. Did you know that our diet of meat, molasses, grits, and cornbread actually caused an epidemic, though, in Alabama? Well, across the country. Did not know that. Yeah, here's the story about it. In the United States, a nutritional disease called pellagra, which was called the Red Death, became a scourge of the South, and it started actually in Alabama, according to UAB records. Today, we know that pellagra is a disease caused by low levels of niacin, also known as vitamin B3. And you can get dementia, diarrhea, dermatitis, all the, they called it the three Ds back then, if it was left untreated and didn't really know what was causing it. A single case happened to take place in Georgia in 1902, and it was reported to the State Medical Association and attributed to spoiled corn, but it tracked little interest. Then in Alabama, Dr. George H. Searcy, in 1906, discovered it at the, the Mount Vernon Insane Hospital for the Colored Insane. It was, it was found in an institution, and they began to wonder what was wrong, you know, it, and why it suddenly showed up. At first, everybody thought, oh, this is a contagious, contagious disease, and we've really got to watch it in, in the institutions, and we have to, you know, quarantine people. But it kept growing in numbers no matter what they did, and it seemed to be affecting the people that lived there, and the physicians didn't get it, and the people who took care of them didn't get it. So it was kind of strange. And in 1911, the Surgeon General of the United States for Public Health, Walter Wyman, said in his annual report that pellagra threatened to become a national calamity. So they thought it was a contagious disease that's going to spread across the whole country that started in Alabama as an epidemic. 
During 1915, estimates of the total number of cases throughout the United States reached 75,000, believe it or not. Can you imagine that? We hear about the flu epidemic back in the early 1900s, but not necessarily about this disease. By the 1920s, there were 100,000 cases per year. So you can see how big it was growing. They thought it was contagious and because it was spreading so fast and they couldn't figure out what was going on. It was usually hitting the lower economic population. The person most equated with its cure, though, was Dr. Joseph Goldberger from the United States Public Health Service. He had been a successful figure in fighting epidemics, and in 1914, he was asked to investigate Pellegra and try to come up with a solution because they were afraid it was going to wipe out the whole country at the rate it was growing. He observed and conducted experiments at southern orphanages where most of it was taking place and, and prisons where a lot of it was taking place. But there was another doctor who didn't get lot recognition from Alabama named Dr. Carl A. Grote. He was Alabama's first county public health official, and he contributed to the cure as well here in Alabama particularly. In February 1914, Dr. Grote was impressed by Dr. Joseph Goldberger's theory that pellagra might be a nutritional deficiency. They were beginning to investigate that. Dr. Grote conducted a field study of pellagra in Walker County mining camps, and he came to three conclusions based on his observations in the mining camps. He decided the disease was not racial or hereditary in nature in any form. Some people have thought that might have been the situation. And there was direct correlation between income and incidence of disease because it was hitting the lower economic people. The diet appeared to offer the most likely explanation for the cure, though, and so he worked very hard on trying to find the solution. And his, But his work was forgotten or ignored. Death from Pellegra peaked throughout Alabama in 1915 when a bow weevil infestation of the cotton crop that year devastated Alabama sharecroppers and tenant farmers, and they had to work and lower their diets. It was known that poor Southerners usually consumed a diet solely of meat, meal, and molasses, which they loved, but it was deficient in vitamins. But it was confusing why the disease hadn't been around in earlier years. Like, you know, why, didn't it, why did it suddenly take place in 1900? Because the diet had been here for years. People have been eating the grits, molasses, and, and meat. And that had been a very popular diet. So, and why didn't it show up during the Civil War days? It amazed everyone why it didn't occur then. Some believe that the changes in the methods of milling corn might have been the result of the outbreak of pellagra. In the South, before, cornmeal was a main source of calories in institutional diets. But despite cornmeal's restricted nutritional value, pellagra was rare or non-existent, like I said before, 1900. And so it was confusing why it suddenly became an epidemic. They realized that corn was naturally low in vitamins, and wheat lost vitamins during milling. And more rural areas had less pellagra. Being away from railroads, they ground their own corn, mostly in old water-driven stone mills. So those old water-driven stone mills were a better and would prevent pellagra. The tradition still exists in the South that stone ground corn is healthier, and according to what they discovered later, it was. The epidemic began shortly after the turn of the century. When degermination of corn began after the bell degeminator was patented in 1900 and 1901. So that's what they figured happened. The, the degermination was supposed to be better, but it, they discovered that the corn was less nutritionally adequate than the previously stone ground corn that they had been getting before. That change in the method of milling corn resulted in the outbreak of pellagra. And when the new method of degerminating corn was introduced, the precarious diet of the poor in mill towns and institutions became even worse, and pellagra appeared. But corn was America's biggest crop, and you can imagine what corn growers thought. They were appalled that their product might be considered unwholesome, so politics began to enter in here, and, and with it being affecting only the poor, people said, hey, you know, it's uh, it's." It's got to be connected to poverty. And so it kind of got a social stigma 
instead of changing the germination of corn and adding more nutrition to a diet, people just said, oh, that's not our problem because corn is, is very important to our diet. Goldberger and his staff set out to identify the missing pellagra nutrients. They knew that was the only way they could get it, uh, change the uh, disease or improve the situation. He wanted to figure out how to get the nutrients and supply them cheaply. He and his men tested nearly every common food for its usefulness against pellagra, which got, gave us a lot of material for the nutrition of foods, which really hadn't been thought about a lot before then. Four years later, they announced that brewer's yeast was a cure. But his research was still unaccepted because it was disparaging of corn. Then in 1927, the Mississippi River overwhelmed its banks and left 112 counties in 12 states underwater. So you can imagine what happened then. Pellegra raged anew. People went to that diet, the corn diet, the cornmeal diet, where the where it was not being milled correctly, and Pellegra just expanded rapidly. At Goldberger's urging, the American Red Cross distributed nearly six tons of brewer's yeast with cures resulting in a few weeks. So that changed the story. Then people realized that he was right. And the daily treatment only cost three cents because brewer's yeast is not that much. It's amazing to see that it costs so little for such a major cure. In 1937, Dr. Conrad A. Elvenham, I believe that's the way you pronounce it, I'm not sure, at the University of Wisconsin identified niacin as the deficiency that caused pellagra. So we must have niacin in our diet. And evidently, it, with a new milling process, it was being removed. Starting in World War II, a commercially produced white bread was enriched with niacin. That's well, how we came about having enrichment foods. It, it became a law to enrich white bread in Alabama with niacin and other vitamins. And that's why we have them today in there. It's important because that because if you did have the meal with the vitamins in it, you had to provide them another way. Plager ended with Dr. Tom D. Spee's Nutritional Treatment Clinic at Hillman Hospital in Birmingham, which operated from 1937 to 1960. So the Red Death started in Alabama and ended in Alabama. And Spies helped define the role of vitamins in human nutrition, and perhaps more than any other person, he contributed to the general clinical application of nutrients in food. One of Spies' latest contributions was in fostering and promoting state and federal laws in the 1940s that required manufacturers to enrich cereal and dairy products with synthetic vitamins and to provide a partial shield against pellagra and other nutritional deficiencies. In 1947, millers were asked to add the vitamins to corn products when they milled the corn for the good health of the people who ate cornbread and grits. They were asked to add a simple attachment on the mill that would add that nutrition to it and, and then solve the whole problem. It's just crazy how, you know, the, a meal of simple as little as grits. And uh, just caused the uh, you know the red death. Well, I guess the the meal didn't, but it was a, our folly into technology and trying to make things better ended up making things worse. Exactly, exactly. And and we, they didn't listen to the people that have discovered the problem because it, it kind of got a socioeconomic category. And our simple meal of grits, loving grits, didn't work out too well for us after 1900 when they changed the. Well, I guess the key process. was you know being brewer brewer's yeast. You know, people could have been cured with a, a beer at breakfast with their grits. Exactly, exactly. I mean, people were dying from this because of that. It was it was not just a minor thing. It's called, it called was, a red death for a reason. I mean, it was, it was a full on plague. You did, little did you know, something as harmless as grit, basic meal would be something that would you know the lack of. Right. I ran across this story and I just said. Oh, well, you know, this is very, very, especially with this UAB uh, has an article about it that it started in Alabama and it ended in Alabama. Yeah, you don't hear Pelegra anymore. I hear, you right. know, you hear, like, the only thing I hear is similar to that is uh, Allegra. <laughs> so, Allegra. Well, that's probably different. Allegra, but, <laughs> yeah, but it's good they got that figured out because I like my grits. And I do, too. Can, I uh, do, too. have a steady and diet now, of grits. You know, and people would shy away from enriched food. But that's how they had to get it, you know, because it it had the stigma that it did. 
they had to get the vitamins in the diet in some way. And so they made laws that the food had to be enriched with that to stop the epidemic. It's amazing. It's a really a kind of amazing story. Yeah, the, you got the enriched foods and then the importance of that. But it also shows that, you know, the flip side about like the genetically modified foods now, you know, you don't know. I and mean, there's, you know, there's a lot of technology that's good and helps things out, but it, we're missing the big picture sometimes. It could do more harm than good. So it's a, it's a good lesson in that to remember. And yeah, and then when they say the stone ground uh, grits were better, they are better because that little invention <laughs> had not been added to the meal. And so they were using it. The old, they were using these old-fashioned meals and stone grounding, and so that's why they talk about it today. The grist mill is the best way to go, is what you're saying, right? Right. The, the Alabama grist, grist mill. No stone ground grist mill. See, the thing about it is, too, the food that we have today is not the same food that our pioneers had. To you know, like you say, the gen- genetically changed and things like that. But the more we can get to those days, that that's why. It didn't cause a disease before then, because that was a, that's what shocked everybody. Why did we suddenly have it now, and we didn't have it before, and we eating the same food? We mm-hmm. couldn't figure and it I out. And I just happened to look over the the simple thing of, you know, the words we were, we're grilling it, or, you know, or not grilling it. We are grounding it up in a different way. Right. So that, and that's what did it. And that's, that's a little thing like it. that triggers, you know, people dying and and trying to spread the word, you got to remember back then we didn't have computers, we didn't have technology, we didn't have TV, we just had no newspapers. <laughs> yeah, Wikipedia. We just had newspapers, and you don't know. Not that Wikipedia is always right, anyway. Right, exactly. I mean, it, it, but you couldn't spread the word. No, you could get the message out, and you couldn't. It's a long story, yeah, and people wouldn't pay attention to it, I guess. Well, I think the big thing is like when you said, you know, the Mississippi River, when it flooded, I mean, just uh, the serendipity of that happening and then Goldberger stepping in and sending all that brewer's yeast down. Yeah. That pretty, you know, that was the kind of the tipping point to make it happen where the people said, hey, we need to take care of this. We need to right. see what's going exactly. on because it, it worked. Exactly. Three cent cure. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's three cents. Yeah. It's just amazing. You know, the little things like that. It's just a happenstance of a flood. You know, all these little things were just very instrumental in making saving people's lives yeah that was a situation where technology invented something to make the meal better you know for the work people who owned them i guess it worked out better and they thought they were doing something pure and it just took away everything the nutrition we just got to be careful we need to study it all you know when we when we see changes we need to look at more of the impact we need to listen to other people that's why it's always good to look back into stories a little deeper before you start making changes. Well, it's a constant reminder to learn from our mistakes. Exactly. Uh, learn, learn from our experience. And listen to people when they figure it out. I mean, we can still have the meal ground the same way with that invention, but we just need to have, be sure we have the nutrition in the food as do we finish with it. And that's what they did. And once they did that, the problem was solved. Well, that's a definitely a, 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 tr- a nice story that Alabama was able to figure that out. And now we can have our grits and know that we're yes. not going to get the red death. That is good. So <laughs> exactly. Well, well exactly. that we'll go ahead and we'll wrap this episode up. Uh, we'll have more coming up in the in the future as we're trying to keep these around, you know, at least a couple a week. And uh, so for your enjoyment. So please subscribe and share with your friends and let people know we're doing this out there. We love all the feedback as well. And with that, we'll go ahead and wrap this episode up and with Red Foley singing the Alabama Jubilee, and we'll see you next time. See you next time. Joe dancing right on his toes. Throws away his crutch and hollers. He let her go, oh, honey. <laughs>